next week at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, February 8th. St. Aloysius Church in New Canaan is presenting a special event with a dynamic speaker, Christina Bennett. Christina, before she was born, was almost aborted until a remarkable intervention saved her life. Since she learned that news, she has spent her adult life standing up for the unborn. As a glimpse into her live presentation next week, she joins Bishop Caggiano today to touch on her life and the work to be done that you can participate in here in Connecticut. This is going to be good. Stay at 1350 AM or 103.9 FM or on your phone with the Veritas mobile app. Remember, the app is available at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or VeritasCatholic.com. And Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and as always, it is my great pleasure to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, it's good to see you as always. Excellency, right? great, great to see you, yeah. You, you kind of make my week, right? <laughs> wow. What do you think of that? I wish my right? wife and kids felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a whole nother podcast, yeah. right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to get right into this because, wow, what a treat we have today for our listeners. We have a special guest on today, and her name is Christina Bennett. And Christina is truly a pro-life warrior. Since learning her own remarkable story when she was in college, she has committed her life to fighting for an end to abortion. Christina has served as a pro-life prayer missionary at the Justice House of Prayer in D.C. and later in Atlanta as a missionary at the International House of Prayer. Christina is a writer whose work has been featured in Live Action News, Life News, Charisma, and Life Site News, among other publications. Her story is also featured in the films Pro-Life Feminist, Still on That Journey, and Here from Heaven. Christina has, the, uh, has had the honor of testifying for the pro-life cause in two congressional hearings, and she served four years as a client services manager at a Connecticut pregnancy center, and she currently works as a news correspondent for live action. Besides all that, she is a devoted wife, mother, and a licensed Christian minister. And our listeners will be able to see and hear Christina live when she comes to St. Aloysius in New Canaan to give her testimony and a talk on Wednesday, February 8th. Christina Bennett, it is such a pleasure to welcome you to Let Me Be Frank. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to take part in this discussion today. Oh yeah, Christina, it's a, it's a tremendous privilege to have you, right? Thank because, you. Because uh, you, you have lived a remarkable life and a remarkable story of faith. So everyone, every time I have a guest, I ask the same question. And that is, would you share with us your life story, most especially your faith journey, and how it has brought you to be so convicted about the value of unborn life and life in general. So what would you want us to yes. know about Christina? Well, I am from Connecticut, which I think is important because it's hard to become pro-life in Connecticut, especially if you've never grown up hearing a pro-life message. I think for my Catholic brothers and sisters, you guys have the blessing of talking about the sanctity of life in your parishes. But I grew up in Protestant churches and I never heard a message on abortion. I never heard a pastor or a minister talk about abortion or sanctity of life. Even in my 20s, when I was at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, if you asked me to tell you something about the pro-life movement or identify someone from the pro-life movement, I would not have been able to. For those who can't see me, um, I am a Black woman. And so growing up in the Black community and in Black churches, it's it's also just very rare. And I had a encounter with God um, at a young age, you know, I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart when I was 12 years old. 
and I began a walk of faith and praying and reading my Bible. Again, not knowing anything about abortion, but just trying to walk out the Christian faith. And then in college, I found out that I was once scheduled to be aborted and that my mom had walked out of her abortion appointment. Now, I can't give away all of the details about that because I am going to be talking about that Good. at the church February 8th. And so I want people to come and hear it. Um, but it was a miraculous encounter. I'll say that. It was a miraculous encounter. And my mom walked out of the abortion doctor's office after telling him that she had changed her mind. But she hid that from me. And she was never going to tell me, but I found out also in a supernatural way. And that was the first time I was confronted with the reality of abortion. Now, growing up in Connecticut, I had friends who had abortions because a lot of people don't know this, but Connecticut, I'm sure you guys are aware of this, of course, but you know, Connecticut doesn't require for teenagers to tell their parents if they mm -hmm. want to have an abortion. We're one of, I think, less than 10 states that it's like that. But we do require for notification and even consent when it comes to tattoos, piercings, and even tanning. So a 15-year-old a girl who wants to go tanning, she has to get her parents' permission. But if she wants to have an abortion, she doesn't even have to tell her parents. So that's the state that you know I'm growing up in. And seeing people get abortions, but I wasn't I wasn't sexually active. I actually got married at in my 30s as a virgin, praise God. So I wasn't pursuing that, so I wasn't thinking about it. But when I found the story out, it really confronted me with this reality of I could have died. I was very close to dying. I would have died if someone hadn't intervened at the last minute. Um the eleventh hour just minutes before I was scheduled to die. And the Holy Spirit speaking to me, telling me, Christina, I wanted you. I wanted you. And that really resonated with me. But then a question was posed that I I sensed the Lord asking me a question. And the question was, Christina, how do you think I feel about the others? Mm. And I was so ignorant. I was just so naive. That I I grew up in a you know broken family. Um, I love my my parents, but they divorced early, and so I was in a different elementary school: first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. I was moving back and forth between my mom and my dad, and state to state. I have a blended family. My dad has um, there's you know six of us kids, and so I'd gone through a lot at a young age, but. When God asked me that question, how do you think I feel about the others? And I knew it had to do with the unborn. I felt a divine, holy responsibility to answer that question with my life and to find out what he meant and to help women who were thinking of having abortions. So that was in my early 20s. I'm 41 years old now. And once I started on that journey, I never looked back. I never looked back. And even though it's been almost 20 years, it's it's funny to say this, but I feel like I'm just getting started, God willing. If God, you know, is to give me however many years, there's so much work to be done. And I I I believe by his grace I will be committed to this fight until I am with him in the next life. That is remarkable. It's remarkable. Thank you. It's remarkable for a lot of reasons, not least of which, as a young woman in her twenties, um, to become so convicted, and to hand your life over to what just kind of like pierced it at that moment, is very rare in some ways. It, it, it's like a Saint Paul moment, right? It's like getting right, right, <laughs> exactly, right. Totally knocked off my horse. Um, <clears throat> Absolutely. Yes. I, I don't even really know how to describe it. I was just called by God. I guess that's the best way that you would say uh -huh. it, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when I was called by God, I just did not care what anybody else thought. I mean, to this day, I'm still like the only person in my family who's like this, you know, now uh -huh. I have my husband, he's like me too. But, but before that, you know, like my, my brothers, my sisters, like 
my dad, like my aunts and uncles, like they don't share my perspective on things. Um, you know, I am just called out from the midst right. of them. Right. And I moved to DC. I mean, when I graduated college, I had job opportunities. I had a degree and I moved, I moved to DC to pray and fast for the ending of abortion to pray in front of the Supreme court for the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And that's what I did. And I ended up doing pro-life ministry from, you know, from there. I was in DC for a couple of years. I went other places, but it was like, I was possessed, but you know, by the spirit of God, I was just, I, it, it, it was just so compelling that I felt this is the most important issue in the world. This is a human right issue. There's, there's nothing more you know, foundational to who we are as human beings than to fight for the right to life. And I have to do something about it. Right. That, that I image still feel that used, way. Well, thank God for that, really. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> thank, I mean, when you, the word possess, isn't that an interesting word? You know, you felt possessed by the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what it is. In a sense, I may almost contradict myself. You are one of the few people who allowed it to happen. But everyone, right. in a sense, can allow it to happen in their lives. If they give their, their heart over to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is there to kind of possess. That is, just kind of like fill your heart and give you that fire and zeal for whatever part of the gospel you feel convicted, you have to lay your life down. For. Right. And so therefore, you, your story is an inspiration to a lot of people, right, who are kind of maybe on the fence. And I, I think to myself, if every Christian in every Christian church was on fire passionately for a piece of the gospel, when you put all the pieces together, what a witness that would be for the world. Right. It would, it would look different. I mean, I know Connecticut would look different. Uh, New England the United States, it would look completely different because there is such, you know, apathy that we have to fight against. Yeah, exactly. Not to not to infringe on your presentation at St. A's, which I encourage everybody to go. Yes. I'm just curious. Um, what was the immediate reaction of your friends? Not so much family, but the, <laughs> when your friends, what did like, wh wh I'm just curious, what, what was their reaction? <laughs> Well, I mean, truth be told, there were seasons when I had to uh, leave behind certain friends. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of my friends from high school that I was very close to when I started walking in this calling, those relationships changed. I still love um, all those people and I have a measure of relationship with them. But, but things changed for me because I was kind of walking this road that was a lonely road. Now, thankfully... When I was in college, I ended up joining a Christian group on campus called Campus Crusade for Christ. And so I had like-minded friends there, um, but I was still carrying this burden that was different than the, the rest of them. And right. so over time, I just, I just learned to walk alone at times and then God would send different people into my life. And so one thing I've told young people over the years is that if you feel called to something, God's going to provide for you and you will suffer loss. I've lost some of the people that I consider to be like best friends. Um, and even when they started doing pro-life work with me and then a couple years pass and then they completely change. I've had a number of friends who were doing pro-life work with me, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And then their faith changed. They walked away from their faith. They they became pro-choice. You know, various things have happened, and it always hurts, of course. But then God always brings someone else, in my experience. So the Lord's always been faithful. And then the most important person he brought was my husband. Um, and he's a, you know, he's a black man who also never really heard a message, I think, about abortion in church either. And one of the first things I said to him when we met was, do you want to go with me to pray outside the abortion clinic in Hartford, which is like the inner city? And uh, he was like... Uh, okay. <laughs> he jokes, he jokes around. He's like, she took me to this area that he calls like, you know, the corner of, he says, murder, death, kill, homicide. He says, he says it's the corner of those, those streets. 
and uh, we're going to go outside and we're going to pray and try to talk to people. He, he had never, ever had anyone say that, but I think I was, I probably was, I don't know if I was testing him or if I was just seeing if he could really walk with me. And he has, he's walked with me. And now of course this passion is um, his as well. And he'll talk to guys and he'll minister to them, you know, who've had abortions. But yeah, I definitely lost friends, but God just restored and, and brought new people along the way. Right. Right. So you have been at this now for almost 20 years. So you have heard yes. every argument in the book that people yes. would say why abortion should be allowed. It should be legal. It's blah, blah. So when a person when a person may say, well, it's just a, it's, it's my choice because it's my body. Um, what would you say to a person like that? What? Well, first, I would point out the reality that when they're saying it's their body, that that's not a honest statement because yes, of course, there is a unborn child residing in your body, but that unborn child has a unique body of its own, which we know this from science and biology. This is not a religious belief. This is just science because what human being on their own is walking around with two heartbeats. If you're walking around with two heartbeats on your own, <laughs> then we need to, you know, you need to call a doctor or something, you know? Um, <laughs> What human being is walking around with another, you know, person's gender on the inside of them? You know, you're a woman, but you're carrying a boy. So we know that there are two distinct bodies and one is obviously housed in the other and dependent upon the other. And so first we have to be honest about that. And then when you can acknowledge that, that there are two bodies, two heartbeats, you know, um, then the question is, what is my responsibility to that unborn child? Because I am more powerful, because I am bigger, um, because I have you know the authority of you're depending upon me. What is my responsibility? Do I do I feel like I have the right to to injure this person? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a person, not cells, not tissue, a human being, a human person. And do I have a right, regardless of what the law says, do I have a moral right to dismember, to poison, to disregard? And to take a human life and to have it incinerated and turned into medical waste and to be disposed of. Now, a lot of times people don't recognize that that's what abortion is. And so when they say, oh, it's my body, my choice, they don't want to go into detail about what that choice actually is. Because if they do, they see that choice is violence, that choice is death, that choice is dismemberment, that choice is a abortionist taking the fetus and after it's been removed, putting it on the table and making sure that there's an arm and a leg and everything else so that therefore that woman's not going to have an infection because you left a body part inside of her. But sometimes a body part is left inside of her and she does go into infection. That's the gruesome reality of abortion. And so what right do we have as human beings to treat another human being like that just because they're smaller, just because they're dependent? So usually that's what I would do. I would acknowledge the reality that there's two bodies and that it's not just your body. And then I would acknowledge the reality that abortion is violence and mm -hmm. it's dehumanization against a person. And to ask the woman, what right does she have to do that? Now she may say she has a constitutional right, even though, you know, Roe, of course, is overturned, but that is, you know, that's debatable. So then I would go into debating that as well. Right. Having a conversation, of course, mm -hmm. because Everything I would talk about would be in love, with compassion, and, right, right. and trying to and trying to build a bridge and trying to have a conversation right. with people because women are hurting. One in four women, you know, women's had an abortion, so a lot of them are, are speaking from a place of pain. And so I try to share my story first, so that they know that I'm speaking from a place of love and not judgment, but I am judging this action because this action is morally wrong. Right. And also it is an affirmation of really a, an act of love for the person that you're speaking with, because in effect, those, those women who have made the choice of abortion, they have long-term consequences, right? Many of them suffer yes. through consequences. Would you speak about that a little bit too, of what the consequences absolutely, are? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I was actually with one of my friends earlier today who has had an abortion and she still struggles with the you know emotional pain of that and the memories and the things that you can't erase. So some women will suffer with now 
unfortunately, the medical society is kind of in bed with Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. So they dismiss the reality of what's called post-abortion stress syndrome or, you know, post-abortion syndrome, and they deny its reality. But you've got thousands of women who have sought out help for symptoms after an abortion. Those can include depression. That can include regret, shame, despair, trouble connecting with the living children that they do have. It can go as far as suicidal thoughts. It can end up in you know eating disorders or even being sexually promiscuous, drug and alcohol addiction, and the list goes on and on. Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry, what they tell people is that the, the number one emotion a woman's going to feel after an abortion is relief. That's a lie. And they make money off abortion. So that's why they're telling you that. But some women will feel a sense of temporary relief if they're looking at abortion as a way out of their problems. They might walk out of the clinic and say, oh, okay, now I don't have to worry about this. But that temporary relief can be gone instantaneously. They can feel it in one second. And then as soon as they get home, everything can change for them in a moment. And then that regret and shame can last them 20, 30, 40 plus years. I've met women who've come up to me with gray hair, you know, a full head of gray hair, uh, tears in their eyes saying, I had an abortion, you know, 40 years ago, and I still remember the pain of it. And so it doesn't always leave them. I will say for the listening audience that there are multiple ways for women who've experienced abortion to find healing. For those who are listening who are Catholic, you know, Rachel's Vineyard is a wonderful program and they have retreats and everything else. Um, regardless if, if you are a person of faith or not, there's an organization called Support After Abortion and you can just Google them, Support After Abortion. And then the pregnancy resource centers all throughout the state of Connecticut and then basically every state in the country, they also have abortion healing programs. One of them is called Forgiven and Set Free. And then there's surrendering the secret. There's, there's a number of different courses that you can take where they'll walk you through healing. So healing is available not only for women, but also for men. So if you've paid for an abortion, if you've coerced a woman into getting an abortion and you are struggling with the regret of that, there's healing available for you too. You don't have to live a lifetime of suffering and sorrow, but I didn't even mention the physical complications along with the emotional there are women who live with the results of a botched abortion. So I'm mm-hmm. talking about a perforated uterus. Their uterus was perforated during the procedure. Baby parts were left inside of them. They were left infertile. Um, I struggled with infertility myself. That's part of the reason why my husband and I adopted through the foster care system. We have a beautiful, wild two-year-old. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> wild and, and beautiful. But to think about, you know, my infertility was just, God knows why, you know, it's just connected to endometriosis and different things. <clears throat> but to have infertility that is a result of a decision that you've made mm. because of an abortion, that depth of pain, I can't even imagine because it's painful to have it in general. But then to have it knowing that you, you in a way, caused it because of an action that you did is even more painful. Nobody wants to suffer like that. But I have met, women, multiple women who, who do deal with that because of an abortion. So Mm -hmm. it hurts women, it hurts men. And of course, ultimately it destroys the life of an innocent child. Yeah. You know, Christine, you raise actually two very interesting points. Um, the first is the role of men in this, right? Because we oftentimes, and rightfully so, we speak about the women because the women are the ones who are the ones who are pregnant and carrying the children, but the men, the potential fathers also have a oh, role yes. to play in this and also experience the after effects and the pain. Would you talk a bit about that? Because that oftentimes is not spoken yes. about. Yes. So part of the reason why it's not spoken about is because in the, you know, the sixties and the seventies, of course, in the when the radical feminists um really influenced America, women like Gloria Steinem and 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 many others, they would say things like, you know, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle and they would say things like, you know, no uterus, no pinion, and they still say those things. And basically the message that was given to men is that you have no say and you you don't have a right to speak up about this issue. And so you've got more than two types of men, but I'll just for the sake of this conversation highlight two. You've got the man who is coercing his girlfriend to get an abortion, pressuring her uh, leaving her, abandoning her, walking away from her, giving her the money to have an abortion, and then and then leaving her. 
And that is horrible and horrific. And many women choose abortion because they're coerced. Then you've also got the other man who is just silent. Mm. He has been emasculated by society's lies. He's been told that he doesn't have a voice. He can't speak out. He's not a woman. He's never been raped. He's never been pregnant. And he believes all those things. And then he does not fulfill his God-given responsibility to be a defender and protector of the vulnerable and the innocent. And he is silent and honestly a coward. And both of those men hurt society. We need men who are bold, compassionate, empathetic, loving, and courageous to fight for women and fight for children. So in the case where uh, a man would not want his girlfriend or his wife to have an abortion, the law doesn't give him any possibility of intervening, right? No, he has no rights. I mean, I'm just going to say it like that. There's no legal rights that a man has. If he, is, he can be married to a woman, he has no rights. He has more rights over property. If he is married to a woman and he wants to get a divorce, he has a better chance of fighting for his car and his house than he would a child that bears his DNA because he has absolutely no rights. And that's really sad. I hope that changes one day. Yeah, without a doubt. And it gives us a lot to ponder about, particularly when we speak of the need to protect all people in all their rights, born and right. unborn, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're, we're going to have a break, I think. I can see Steve looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Waving my arms. No, this is, uh, this is such an important conversation, and I'm glad we're having it. And we will continue this conversation on the other side of the break. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Bishop Caggiano is talking to Christina Bennett, a pro-life warrior who will be speaking uh, on February 8th at St. Aloysius in New Canaan. So make sure you uh, you sign up and you go and you, and you, and you watch her. Um, but we'll be right back after if the break. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. On Wednesday, February 8th, Christina Bennett is coming to St. Aloysius Church in New Canaan for a talk that you can go and listen to so important and she is so dynamic and so amazing we are blessed to have her on with us today speaking with bishop caggiano um about the pro-life movement and women in crisis mm -hmm. and what we can do so excellency mm -hmm. yeah. well i'm just going to add that talk is at seven o'clock just for everyone knows it's 7 p.m at saint aloysius okay so christina thank you for the tremendous conversation so i'm just going to to ask you just just another circumstance we all know that there are many women who are struggling because they don't have full employment. Even with full employment, they don't make enough money to raise their children. They struggle financially. They struggle in their communities. They find themselves pregnant and they're told, well, you know what? How are you going to raise this child? Who's going to support it? How's and so they almost feel as if they have no choice. So my question is, in your experience over these years, what, what can we do as Christians and as people of goodwill, to help those women so that that situation they find themselves doesn't propel them 
to a decision of abortion? How can we be of concrete help to those women? Well, that's a really great question because we want to consider the practical needs that women face because many women will state that the number one reason driving them to have an abortion is financial reasons. And especially now that we're living in a time where it's expensive to get eggs, it's expensive to get gas, what do we do? For four years, I served as the client service manager of the ABC Women's Center, which is a pregnancy resource center in Middletown, Connecticut. And ABC is one of the around 20 pregnancy centers in the state of Connecticut, and then they have them all across the country. And they provide support not only during pregnancy, but even up to two years after the baby is born. And by support, I mean they offer maternity clothes, they offer diapers, they offer parenting classes that are free. They offer resources and support for women when a baby comes. They give them a beautiful gift full of brand new baby clothes and all sorts of different things. Oftentimes they can connect people with churches and the churches might do a baby shower, give the woman a crib and a car seat. And I know that's just the beginning, um, but you got to start somewhere. And that's a really good place to start being surrounded by people who will help you and give you those resources. In addition to that, they can help them to find jobs They can help them to refer them to other programs. You know, Connecticut has a lot of resources, whether that's WIC, that's a resource that women are able to get and that gives them formula and that gives them some food, whether that's, you know, Section 8, which is, you know, a housing program, whether that's they need to get into a maternity home or maybe even a domestic violence shelter if they're dealing with some kind of domestic violence. So there are these resources, but we can't just depend, of course, solely on, you know, government resources, the church, of course, has to come in and to wrap their arms around these women. And sometimes it's simple things. So I'm working with, you know, a few different women right now, um, two who are pregnant and, and, and some that are, you know, mothers that were, I knew them when they were pregnant. And the things that they come to me the most for are babysitting. One of them Mm. is, you know, she's a single mom. She's got two kids. I met her through the pregnancy center when I used to work there and she's got a job. She's got an apartment now, but she needs help with babysitting. These are just simple things. Um, If people in your church got together and said, okay, let's do, you know, a woman's group with like five or six of us and we're going to alternate. And, you know, every two weeks or once a month, one of us is going to do babysitting for a single mom or a mom who's in need. Sometimes it's transportation. One of the moms that I'm talking to is currently pregnant she doesn't have a car. So I raise money for her and I'm getting her like taxi rides to go to work or um, Christmas presents and things like that. So I think when people think like I'm helping a woman, oftentimes they think, well, I can't afford to like pay her rent, you know? Well, sometimes there's government programs that can help with that. And sometimes the rent is lower than you think, but you don't have to necessarily pay her rent. Um, Even babysitting so she could go to work or helping her get a ride so she can go to work or something like that can make a big difference or giving her clothes, giving her diapers. So if we just come together and we're willing to do something, something is better than nothing. So I just think as long as you have someone that's willing to walk with a woman, there are times when you're going to say, I'm sorry, I don't have that to give or I can't do that, but give what you can and they will appreciate it. Right. Or if to, uh, uh, Another way to put it was simply to say, I think, if everybody gave something, that something would be an awful lot. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I can't tell you how many times I think to myself, I just wish I had, you know, three more people that were that were committed to to doing this, to standing up for life, because it would make a big difference. Right. And of course, there's hundreds of thousands of Christians just in Connecticut alone. There's 400,000 Catholics just in our diocese in Fairfield County, right? So we're talking, that could be an army of people. That's an army of people. Well, Lord, come on, raise the army up. I'm (laughs) I'm ready, you know? Well, you could be our leader, right? (laughs) Yeah, you know, I'm ready to talk to anybody who wants to, you know, who wants to fight with me because it does get lonely. And I mean, we haven't even mentioned political stuff yet, um, but even when we testify, because what people may not know is the pregnancy centers, they've had to be in the Capitol building in Connecticut for the past, you know, four years or so fighting because yes. legislators are trying to shut them down. They say lies about them. And if we're not showing up as the church to testify, if we're not showing up to to tell our senators, 
you know, stop harassing these pro-life centers. That's right. That's right. That's right. And there's and so, more coming, you know, from oh, that. Oh, without a doubt. No, without a doubt. And I think there's tremendous, it's tremendously important, so we can make a plug, that in March, when we have our state March for Life, it's extremely yes. important that everybody come out and support that for the very reason that you're suggesting. Because now, and we'll talk about this now as next, about how the landscape has changed now that Roe v. Wade has basically been overturned. All the battles are now in the states. Right, right. And the battle is on our ground. Like, we are on the battleground. And what people may not realize about Connecticut is that our legislators who are pro-abortion they're not satisfied with the things the way they are. I I just saw a piece of legislation that has to do with prohibiting religious organizations from restricting abortion. Now, this legislation was proposed by a state rep, Jillian Gilchrist, who is a former NARAL director, which is a pro-abortion rights group. Now, the legislation has just been proposed, you know, so it, it's not been passed or anything. But, and I, I don't know exactly what it's about, but I question if it has to do with Catholic organizations or faith-based organizations who maybe don't want to perform abortions, like hospitals. It's yet to be seen. But just the fact that there is a bill with that kind of language Absolutely. connecting religious organizations and abortion is very concerning. And so there's things like that that are being proposed right now, and we have to be aware of it, and we have to fight. So yes, come to the march. I'm emceeing the march, actually. Are so, you? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yep. Great. I and am what, uh, hosting what, the march. What's the date? Oh, that's a good question. I should know that. Let me uh, let me look it up. It's and March, see. though. Yes. It's actually in the month of March. I know that, but Is I it... do have the date on my phone, so I will I will find it. But I was last year. I, I shared my testimony at it, and that was really powerful. It is Wednesday, March 22nd at 12 p.m. Yes, and there were Wednesday, about 5,000 people, I think, um, last year, right? Yeah, so, we had thousands of people. And the Catholics held it down. I mean, I will I, – that's why I love my Catholic brothers and sisters because you guys really hold it down. And you know, Knights for Columbus came and oh, yeah. they had oh, buses yeah. and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this it year we're awesome. aiming for twice as much. Twice as much because, as you said, now the battle is the state. And there's another uh, thing that I saw, which is also being proposed, a fund for Connecticut uh, taxpayer dollars to go towards people coming from out of state to have abortions. Yeah, here. which is, which is, I mean, I, I, I just, I find that just astonishing to be very, like, what do they call that? Sanctuary something? Say, yeah, say, yeah, a sanctuary state. But yeah. our legislators are wanting to raise money to pay for other people's abortions to come from out of state to right. come to Connecticut. This is insane. You know, the Catholic Conference and Chris Healy, they did a report a couple of years ago and they found out that 70% of the abortions in Connecticut are paid for by our taxpayer dollars. 70% of the abortions in Connecticut are paid for by Medicaid from our taxpayer dollars. That is insane. We are literally paying for bloodshed and our state, you know, it's suffering. A lot of people are leaving Connecticut for various reasons and we're suffering because we are paying for bloodshed. Right. And also it puts uh, good, faithful, conscientious believers of every persuasion in the very compromised position of paying taxes where they have no control. That's uh, even a portion of their money is going for this very thing. Exactly. It's so, it's so disturbing because yeah, you would have to not pay your taxes in order to not be a part right. of the system. Right. And it's it's really awful. And so we have to let our voices be heard. Not to mention the fact that when when Medicaid pays for abortions, it's not only a matter of our tax money going towards it, and that's horrible, but women are also being coerced by the very state to have an abortion. Because if you think about it, if a woman's vulnerable and she's undecided, but she knows that all she has to do is just go in you know, show her Medicaid card, her abortion's paid for. Now, the state law says it's only for women's health and these desperate situations, but that's not true. One of my dear friends who had an abortion told me that, Christina, they don't even ask you any questions. They don't ask you any questions. They just swipe your Medicaid card and keep it moving. And that dear friend actually had baby parts left inside of her, and she was then later 
had to go to the emergency room because of the abortion she had in Harford. And she's testified publicly before the Connecticut state legislator and told them, this is what happened to me because it was very devastating. But women who are vulnerable, if they know, well, I don't have to pay for this. I am also working with a young woman. I've met a young woman, talked to her who was out of state going to college, but she knew she could come home to Connecticut to get an abortion that was paid for. She didn't even want the abortion. Her boyfriend was pressuring her to have the abortion. She came here, she took the abortion pill, and she lost her fertility. And she's in her early 20s. She oh, got wow. so sick, she was hospitalized for a month. She was hospitalized for a month. She's a young black girl, beautiful girl. And she's in therapy now for depression and because she lost her fertility uh-huh. from the abortion pill. And paid speak- for by our taxpayer dollars. And speaking of the abortion pill, I just recently received an email from someone who's very committed to pro-life. And in it was a picture of a drive through at a pharmacy, whether it was Rite Aid or CVS, whatever it was, where they list literally for just the purchasing the abortion pills. So you have to go in the in the place to get the flu, you know, stuff for flu, because that's all locked up. Other things were all locked up. This you could go to the window and just ask for it and you get it and off you go. Yes, <laughs> I, I hate to say that, but it's very true. Unfortunately, the FDA and these these pharmaceutical companies, they've made a decision now that Walgreens and CVS and these other organizations are going to offer the abortion pill. And that is a very devastating decision because now they're going to turn women's bathrooms into abortion facilities. You know, there are many women who've had abortions and it's so devastating that they can't even drive past the location where they had the abortion. But imagine that location being their own bathroom, their own home. It's it's just, it's, it's so heartbreaking to even think about that reality. People could be bleeding out. People could be having blood clots in their own home. And they're going to be very less likely to go to a doctor, especially if they're young people, because they're going to have to then tell their parents, I got this pill and, you know, or they're going to have to admit to maybe their spouse doesn't know and they're doing it privately. And so they might try to deal with the consequences on their own and they could die. That's how serious it is. Women have died. I think there's 22 women who have died from the abortion pill and the FDA covers up those stories. And so this be bold and, you know, write letters and call and tweet and, and tell the people who own these pharmaceutical companies that, that you don't want abortion sold along with Tylenol and Advil and everything else. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. I had never even thought of the image of the abortion. The place of the abortion is your own home. And therefore, your own you, bathroom. It, it, the memory is there for as long as you live there and perhaps, you, of course, your whole life. But wow, that's that's quite frightful. So let me ask you, you are very well versed in the political landscape. So I'm going to mimic some some things that people have said to me, repeat things that said sure. to me. So Bishop, now that Roe versus Wade is overturned, right? So what's what's to do next? Like, isn't that the victory that we've been looking for? What's your response? Uh, yes and no. So it is absolutely a victory that we have been praying for for close to 50 years. And some people will never see an established law overturned, a precedent overturned like that in their lifetime. So praise God that we were able to witness that and work towards mm-hmm. it. At the same time, throughout the state and a majority of the country, uh, the, the states in our country, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Abortion is still legal. You can still go kill your baby. And in some states like ours, the government will pay for it. And so... The work that we have is vast. We have everything to do to change our individual state and to change our culture, not only prohibiting abortion, but making it safer and easier for women to carry their pregnancy. So whether that's paid parental leave, whether that's affordable daycare, whether that's fighting pregnancy discrimination so that women don't feel like, if I tell my boss I'm pregnant, he's going to fire me. There has to be, you know, recourse for that. They have to know that no, if he tries to fire you when he when he, you know, finds out you're pregnant, there's going to be some legal consequences there. We have to do that. I mean, people were talking about on the news a lot about this poor woman, like 
just, she lost her mind. Um, you might've heard the story and she had pregnancy psychosis and she ended up killing her children just happened outside of Boston. And the whole thing is horrible because she was a labor and delivery nurse and seemed to love her children. And she had pregnancy related psychosis, which if you've never seen someone with psychosis, it's hard to imagine how someone could do something so evil, but I have witnessed someone dealing with psychosis and they change into a different person. It's an extreme mental break, but there's so many women who are dealing with, um, you know, postpartum depression or even, you know, beforehand they're dealing with, um, just mental illness that causes them to sometimes, unfortunately, die in pregnancy, in maternal mortality, infant mortality. And so on so many different fields, you know, there's work for us to do. So you can do work politically. You can fight for basic things like parental notification laws. We don't have those in the state of Connecticut. You can fight for those. You can lobby for those. You can go to the sidewalks. Abortion clinics are still open. You can go with 40 days for life. You can pray in front of the abortion clinics. Even if you don't go for, with 40 days for life, you can go with a small group of people and you can pray outside. You can do sidewalk counseling. You can go volunteer at a pregnancy resource center. You can go to your church and say, hey, can we have a program for women and families? Can we do something? You can start a program. No matter what your skills are, no matter what you're passionate about, trust me, there's something that you can do. If you're a man, you can counsel young men. You can talk to them about abstinence. You could talk to them about what it means to have a family. Because look at these young men, you know, all across the country. There's so many things, you know, they're addicted to pornography. They're um, they're watching video games day and night. Um, they're having children later and later. They're resisting marriage. Sometimes they don't even know how to, to have a healthy relationship. They're, they're fatherless. So across the board, there's so much work to be done. Oh my gosh, without a doubt. The other thing too is, I think since all of this is now on the level of the states, the states that are militantly pro-abortion represent the lion's share of all of the population of the United States. So you yes. look at the East Coast and West, particularly in the Northeast and in New England, in the Pacific states and all the rest, the, the, the majority of Americans have seen no change, you know? So when people say, right. when you look at the map, and they try to give this graphic that, oh, the, the, the vast majority of the country is, has has politicians and legislatures that are advocating to restrict abortion. But in fact, a lot of those states are just, I was going to say empty, but there's not a lot of people in those states. A lot of people right. are in the states that are radically pro-abortion. Is that fair? Like New say? York. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say that. New York, California, New York has some of the highest abortion rates in the entire country especially for black children. Um, they have the highest you know, abortion rates in the nation, California, in these states. And as you said, like they are rabidly like, pro-abortion. They are just so committed to what they would call reproductive rights, but we, what we know as abortion and um, the termination of a human life. And so there's a lot of work to be done. And this is not a time for us to sit back and congratulate ourselves. I mean, yes, of course, when Roe got overturned, I cried. I celebrated. We went out to dinner um, because I've been fighting for almost 20 years. So I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to cry. And I'm still very grateful. I just went to D.C. last week for the March for Life. Mm -hmm. And being there, I thought this is the first march after Roe. This is very beautiful. You know, you shed a tear. But at the same time, it's like, I know I'm coming back to Connecticut. And even being in D.C., you know, a woman can get an abortion in D.C. Right. You know, a woman right. can get an abortion here. And so the battle rages on before us. And we can't get complacent and we can't just sit back and say, okay, well, Roe's overturned because listen, our government, they want to codify Roe forever. I mean, that's what they want to do. And they don't have the numbers to do that right now, but don't think that it's something that they're not pursuing. You know, President Biden um, and different pro-abortion elected officials on the national level, if it's up to them, they will find a way to, you know, to bring it back in a different measure. And so we have to be vigilant. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you said something before that I found fascinating. You called yourself a pro-life feminist. So what does yes. that mean? Tell me. <laughs> well, you know, it's one of those words that it means so many different things to different people. And I understand that it's a word that can be very triggering to people, especially those who've grown up and seen 
you know, radical feminists, like I mentioned before, who have um, in the sexual revolution deceived many people. But we have to remember that before there were those radical feminists, there were Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Alice Paul and other uh, women's rights leaders, feminists, suffragists, whatever they call themselves, who are fighting for the right to vote, who are fighting for the right for women to be able to go to school, to own property, to marry who they wanted, and things like that. And so for me, it just basically means that I believe in fighting for women's rights. And I also believe that women's rights began in the womb. And so I think that the secular, progressive, you know, feminist movement that we see with, you know, the pink hats and, you know, they're marching at the Women's March, they are not truly advocating for for women. Because if they were, they would be about ending abortion and making it safer for women to know that they don't have to choose between ending the life of their child and having a career. They don't have to choose between abortion and family or abortion and career or ministry or something else. And so I think a pro-life feminist is one who is fighting for both the woman and the child. And they're not only focused on ending abortion, saving the baby, but they're also focused on ending pregnancy discrimination and ending, you know, or reducing domestic violence and making it safer for women. I grew up in a family of, unfortunately, because of violence and and, and toxic, you know, um, situations and abuse and, and various things. I grew up in a family of mostly women. And, um, I thank God I have a, you know, a strong husband today and, and I'm married and, you know, have a beautiful family, but I saw the ways in which women were abused and mistreated. And for me, being a pro-life feminist means I want to fight for them and I'm, and I'm going to fight for them because I believe they're made in the image of God and they have dignity and worth and value. And I want to see them prosper and it's other things as well that like we don't have time to get into, you know, fighting against, um, you know, just this culture that dehumanizes women, sex trafficking and, um, oh, yeah. you know, all the oh, different things that cause women to um, feel as if they sometimes need to use their bodies in a way to, you know, advance their careers and things. Fighting against that and fighting for women to be whole and to live out the destinies that God has right, called them to. Right. That's a tremendous definition of feminism. Right. In Thank the case you. Center, it's both the child and the and and the mother, and it's it's our responsibility to protect both, right, and to serve both and to uplift right. both. Yeah, it's right. tremendous. Now, Thank before you. we before we run out of time, I'm just curious. So, you gave testimony in Congress more than once. I did twice. Yes, right. once in so, person, and then once during the pandemic on Zoom. All right. So, what was that experience like? Oh gosh, um, there was a lot of different emotions. So. When I was in D.C., it was a panel on abortion, and because it was the Democratic panel, um, they had more of the speakers. So there were six pro-abortion speakers and only two pro-life, so we were definitely outnumbered. I had an abortion doctor next to me and then an abortion doctor at the end of the table. So on a personal level, I reached out to both of them, went to shake their hands, and, um, and even after one of them had said awful things about me, you know, before, um, in the hearing, I still went up to her. She's a black doctor. And I said to her, Oh, I just wanted to shake your hand. I think she was so surprised to see me do that, but I was trying to show the love of Christ, but the Republican, um, congressional leaders were very kind and asked us questions. Some of the other ones were not so kind. I won't name the name of one, but one of them like grilled me. I mean, was just kind of staring at me and and honestly had like an evil smirk on his face when I was even telling my story about escaping abortion. He was just like smirking at me. It was really demonic, to be honest with you. Um, I have never seen anything like it. Um, and all the times I've shared my story, I've never seen anyone looking at me with like this kind of evil smirk. So that was so chilling and, and creepy. But when he was doing that, I thought, you're not going to intimidate me. So you can smirk as much as you want. You are not going to intimidate me. I'm going to finish saying what I have to say. And, you know, by God's grace, I did. But there was an actress there, uh, Busy Phillips, who is a, a professional actress. And she had an abortion and she came to talk about how uh, liberating that experience was for her. And uh, after it was over, it was sad that a lot of the news cameras and everything just went to Busy, went to tell her story. And the two of us who are pro-life 
They didn't really want to talk to us. It was me and my friend, Melissa Odin, who's a, a, a survivor of an actual abortion procedure. She was born alive from a botched abortion, left to die. At one point, one of the congressional leaders asked Busy, um, he said, you know, Miss Phillips, do you believe that uh, a, a baby that's born alive should have medical care? And she didn't really want to answer the question, kind of, well, I'm not a doctor, but I've played one on TV, it was kind of like her answer, didn't want to deal with it. But then one of the most disturbing things that stuck out to me about the entire hearing was they asked the black abortion doctor, um, do you think a baby born alive after an abortion should have medical care? And she, again, hesitated to even acknowledge that babies are born alive after an abortion. But once she did, she said, well, yes, but not if there's like, you know, disabilities or if they've been severely, you know, basically severely damaged from the abortion, because then if they're given medical care, it would be a, a, a waste of resources. Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. That, that, that's, thought, that summarizes oh, the problem. Well, that yeah. summarizes the challenge. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I was just wow. taken aback. She said it so casually. It would be a waste of resources. I thought a waste of resources to revive a baby that's been almost killed by, you know, the human hands of a, of a doctor like yourself. Wow. Amazing. I, it was troubling. I hate to jump in, but we are up against the clock. So we need to take one more break. We'll be back with a listener question. Uh, this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Bishop Caggiano has been speaking with the very excellent Christina Bennett about uh, the issue of life. We'll be right back. I owe my life to my mother's courage. These are the words of Christina Bennett, a dynamic pro-life speaker and advocate who will share her incredible personal story and speak about supporting life from pregnancy through end of life. Join us for this free event on February 8th at 7.30 p.m. at St. Aloysius Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. Christina's talk is appropriate for ages 14 and older, and we encourage families to come listen together. To reserve your place, please visit the St. Aloysius website at www.starcc.com and click on the heart on the right-hand side of the page or send an email to respectlife at starcc.com. There is plenty of room and free parking. We hope to see you there on Wednesday, February 8th. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank. Uh, with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Okay, so Steve, this week we're doing something new. Instead of you asking me a question, somebody, I'm going to ask you a question. All right. And my question to you is, you ready? Is this, this your moment of fame? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when is Christina giving her presentation in, in our diocese? Oh, good. It's a question that I know the answer to. That is <laughs> 7 p.m. Wednesday, February 8th. Wednesday, February 8th at 7 p.m. Go to St. Aloysius in New Canaan. You can go on their website, and their website, I know, is starcc, so S-T-A-R-C-C dot com. That's St. Aloysius' website. You can find the information, but it's 7 p.m. Wednesday, February 8th. Okay. Christina, you, you passed your first question, by the way. Yay. You get you get 100%. <laughs> I, I, you know, I wanted to also point out uh, that I am so grateful that you pointed out the difference. And Excellency, you do this all the time. The difference between a, um, a suffering woman and how we need to approach her with love versus those who are dogmatic about, you know, this child must die, you know, and right. we need to approach them so differently. Um, so thank you for, for doing that. And if I may, just to allow me, and also those who are dogmatic on the other side who say, well, this child has to be born and then leads the question at that when there's a mother right. involved too, right? It's both. Right. Yes. It's absolutely both. 100%. Yes. Right. Christina, thank you for participating in the podcast. You were just tremendous. You're welcome. Be before we Before we do that, I just do need to thank also our sponsor, which is Foundations in Faith. It's a grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization that makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations and Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport. You can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. And Christina Bennett, thank you so much for joining us, as uh, His thank Excellency you. was saying. Yeah, Where else can uh, folks go to get more from you? ChristinaBennett.com, Black Pro-Life Woman on Instagram, Black Pro-Life Woman on Twitter, 
Christina Bennett on Facebook. I'm on all the different social media channels. And of course, my website, you can email me on there if you want to talk to me. And go and meet her and hear more from her next week, February 8th at 7 o'clock at St. Aloysius. Amen. Excellent. Amen is right. Amen. Before you, before we go, would you please give us your blessing? Sure, sure. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord our God, we give you thanks for this conversation. We give you thanks for Christina and for her conviction and for her witness and for her ministry, for all that she does to protect those who are most vulnerable in our midst. Bless our listeners. May the fire of conviction for the protection of unborn life and life in all its stages continue to grow in each of our hearts. And may your Holy Spirit bless and guide us. For we ask this in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank Christina. God bless you. Steve, I'll see you next week. Thank you. God bless you guys. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.